one of the songs said, um, I know how the story ends. Right? I know how the story ends. How many here know how the story ends? Okay, how many know that how the story ends? You know how the story ends? The story of our life. Good, that was the second question. <laughs> All right? I guess an obvious one, right? Amen. That's right. Ultimately, that's how the story ends. That's, that's the ending to the, to the story of our lives. Right? That is the will of the Father. That is the purpose of God. God always intended to have an intimate and personal relationship with man. There is no devil, there is no, no hell, no the gates of hell, there is no sickness, no plague, nothing can stop that. That's God's ultimate plan for man. But in all reality, and I'm not saying in all cases, this is not for everybody here, but if the shoe fits, wear it. And if it don't apply, let it fly. Not everybody sitting in these chairs today feels comfortable to say, they know when the story ends. Unfortunately, many people will raise their hand and say that they know how the story ends, but in their heart, there's doubt. There's uncertainty. Sometimes it's the trials, the tribulations, the difficulties that we go through in everyday life that, that will cause us to doubt the way that the story ends. But I'm here to tell you this morning, you don't have to doubt. Right? Because if my salvation depended on my works, now don't get me wrong, your faith, the faith that you and I claim to have, if, if it's not accompanied by works, then that faith is dead. The evidence, the evidence that you are and I are saved are our works. It's not what saved us, right? Because then Christ would have died in vain. If our works are what saves us, then Christ would have died in vain. Then what do we need God to come down to earth and become a man and die on the cross in such a death if you and I through works could be saved? All men are saved by grace, by faith and grace of God of which a man is saved. But the evidence of your salvation in mine is our works. Our works are what points to that we're saved. It's the same thing. It's the same thing in the world. You know a person likes to drink. Why? His works prove it. The life that he lives, the places that he frequents, right? Huh? The people that he hangs out are evidence of what he likes to do in life. So our works are evidence that we're saved, that no matter what we're going through, we're still here in church. That no matter what we're going through, hallelujah, we pray to God, we fast, we stay in the scriptures, we worship and we praise that is evidence that we're saved. Huh? I tell people all this all the time because the Lord taught me that. And if people that will do all these things, they will check all these boxes, yet still feel uncomfortable to say, I know how the story ends. That's how the enemy works. He works through planting seeds of doubt. Getting you to look at yourself. Getting you to look at your work. Getting you to look at what you, where you lack at. What, what, what you should be doing more of. And that could be true. But that doesn't, your salvation does not depend upon that. Your, your salvation depends on what Christ did on the cross for you. Huh? And that's a beautiful thing. You and I can know how the story ends. All you got to do is read the book. And read the book. And read the book. And study the book. And meditate in it day and night. And don't depart from it neither left to the right. But keep staying in the word of God. That word is your lamp. It's your guide. Huh? So you should know, and I should know, how the story ends. And if you really want to know the ending, go to the book of Revelation because it gives you the ending. <laughs> yeah? It's going to show you. So I'm here to tell you, man, be strengthened in the Lord. Uh, 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 rejoice in the salvation of the Lord. This is a process. It begins uh, at the cross, and it ends at, at, at the moment of death or when that trumpet sounds. But sanctification is a process. Some take a little longer than others. Some go through things that others don't go through. Some are changed overnight. Huh? 
Some were willing to do like Peter. In the moment of him working, having a family responsibility at home, he still let the note go, the net go, he let the boat go, he let everything go, and he followed Jesus. Some will go back and pick up the net for a while and get in the boat for a while. That happens. Huh? But no one thing that Jesus loves you. Don't ever forget that. All right? He's not man because that's why the Bible says that he's not a man. He's not a man that he should not lie, right? God promises something, he's always going to keep it. But it really means that he's not a man, period. What you get from man, you will never get from God. Huh? The fallacies and the disappointments and the letdown and the hurt and the grief that you get from man, you will never get from God. God will never harm you. God will never cause any harm to you. God will never disrupt the flow of your life. God doesn't do that. God loves each and every one of us here. Huh? But there's one thing, and really not one thing, but it's one thing that we've been focusing on lately, the last couple of weeks, and we're, 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 we're hoping to close this today, you know, is one thing God expects from us. See, and that's the thing. That's the reason why many men uh, falter, you know, and have doubts and, and have, they're uncomfortable to say they know how the story ends. And the reason being is because they have not surrendered all areas of their life to Christ. That's the bottom line. And I shared this in a group not too long ago, uh, uh, and, and this the Lord has taught me and has shown me through scriptures, right? Yes, children may go out, please. Yeah, children's church, please go out. Thank you for reminding me, Stacy. Thank you. Please. Children may go out. Sorry, you ain't going out no more? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Praise God. But um and, and that's the that's the reality of it. It's surrendering our whole lives to God. And in all reality, we don't want to do that. But the number one enemy that the Lord has taught me to complete and total surrender to him is reservation. That's the fact. That's why some Get, some God does, listen, listen, God is a God that, that can do things immediately. He can do things over the night. He can do things in the blink of an eye. Imagine that when that trumpet sounds, that God is going to take our mortal bodies, the, the bodies that hurt, that, that our bodies that, that get weak, our bodies that get weary, our bodies that get tired, right? Right? That God can take that and man, fill with diabetes, fill with cancer, fill with whatever disease it may be. And God can take that in a blink of an eye and change it to an immortal body. Now tell me something. Is that, have you never pondered that? Because that's how God works. That's how God wants to work. But sometimes that's not the result in our life. Why? The fault never lies with God but with us. Because I have reservations. There's things that I'm holding on to, things from the past that I still like to do or I want, I, I want to partake in. Sometimes it's just I haven't suffered enough consequences. I can speak for myself. I can speak for me. That's how it was with me. I wasn't afraid of nothing. I wasn't intimidated by nothing. Everybody, oh, you're going to do life in prison? Well, bring it on. I'm ready. Don't worry about it. Huh? This is going to happen to you. You're going to die. Well, well okay. Well, whatever's going to happen, I'm going I'm to let it happen, right? I'm okay with it. I'm at, at peace with it. But then I got beat so down so much by life and so many disappointments and so many failures, having so many kids and not having the ability to look in their eyes and tell me, yeah, daddy's going to be. All those things wore down on me. When they put those cuffs on me, I surrendered. I didn't surrender to men. I didn't surrender to the police. I surrendered to God. I had had enough. I had nothing left. Huh? Many people would have looked at my life and would have been like, oh, you got plenty uh, to hope for. Huh? But listen, money, fame, the streets, none of those things can bring you joy. None of it. The only one that can give us joy is God, right? But some of us are experiencing part of God, some of God, not all of God. And, and what your experience of God right now in your life is, is the sum total of all that you've given to God. That's the difference. Hey, there's nothing else to talk about but that. In the evidence, you can look at the disciples alone. 
I mean, like Jesus called Peter, and Peter, Peter, had a, Peter was married. He had a mother-in-law, and she was sick. Peter had a responsibility. He was a fisherman. But yet he gave it all up. That's surrender. Matthew was a tax collector. He had a job. He had a responsibility. He had to answer to the king. This could cost him his life. But Jesus told him, get up from there and follow me. And he didn't think about nothing else but following Jesus. Now, you may not be a tax collector. You may not be a fisherman. You may not be like Luke, a, a, a physician, uh, right? You, you, it, it, a matter of fact, it might not be a career that you're giving up, but there's something that God is asking you to give up, and I don't have to give into details. You know what it is, yet you don't want to. You say you do, but that's a lie from the pit of hell. You and I know that. There's no way you can say, God, take it on. God ain't going to take it on. I'm sorry. You can't come to me with that guasimilla. No, you can't come to me with that. That is not true. Okay? The truth is when you tell God, listen, we can't on our own strength and our own ability, we can never give all to God. We can't do that. One thing is we don't want to do that. There's some things that we cherish, some things that we like to do. There's some things that bring satisfaction to us, and it's because you haven't suffered enough consequences yet. Trust me, the consequences will come. And there's people here sitting today that know what I'm talking about and would say, amen, pastor, you're right. They know it. They're going through it. Huh? God will give you a rope. Yes, he will. But sooner or later, he's going to, and you don't think it is, and you don't believe it's that, <laughs> but I'm going to show you in the word that it is true. I've showed you before and it's true. God will not contend always. His spirit will not contend always with man. God says, sooner or later, I will turn you over to whatever it is that you desire, that whatever it is that you want to do, I will turn you over to it. That's what you want. I'm going to give it to you. And then, he, then, and then in Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to 32, he goes into all the consequences that will come about for you and I persisting to sin. He said, this is what's going to happen. If you're a man, ooh, read it. And if you're a woman, this is going to be the evidence of I turned you over to what you wanted. See, we, we think that just standing in front of an idol, right, is, is worshiping uh, 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 something that God created over the creator, right? That's, 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 I think that's an easy one. Huh? But it could be your child. If your child comes before God, that is your idol. You're worshiping something that God created above the creator. And in the end, he says, I will turn you over. Simple. And we know we went through that. Uh, uh, Genesis 22, 2, I shared that with you. Because there's people that don't believe that. How is God going to ask me to sacrifice my child? Abraham thought the same way. He's like, how, how is it possible that you're going to ask me to kill my child? Right? And we all talk about the obedience of Abraham and how Abraham, you know, got everything ready and, and, and then took his son up to the mountain, right? And then by faith, he says, I know we'll return. He didn't say, I will, but we will. We talk about that. It's important. But what about the obedience of the son? Huh? The son asked him real quick. He said, hey, Dad, I see everything ready there. You got the fire. You got the wood. You got the knife. You got, the, you got everything ready. But Where's the sacrifice? <laughs> huh? Where's the sacrifice? Well, just like the situation where Abraham, the sacrifice is whatever you're putting before God. God says, I want it. But he told Abraham, go and sacrifice your son whom you love. In all reality, what God was telling him, who you love more than me. Give me him. Bring them here. Huh? How many of us are willing to do that? Listen, I know there's people sitting in these chairs today that love their children more than God. And people that are listening, that's a fact. Huh? That love their children more than God. You ain't doing your child no justice by loving your child more than God. You're giving them the worst example that a parent can give their child. Huh? What did Solomon tell his son? He said, my son, give me your ear. Huh? 
listen, pay attention to what I'm going to tell you. And he said, the fear of God is the principal thing. Huh? That's a father teaching the child that, hey, the principal thing is God. In the beginning was God. Anything that you do in life must be God. Anything that you try, you want to aspire in life must be God. If it's a career that you want to choose, it must be God. All things must begin and end with God. There is no greater lesson that you could teach your child. Huh? Surrender. It's probably the hardest thing that a man can do is surrender his life completely to God. Like I said, you can't do it. I can't do it. But what we can do is give God access. Be honest with God. Listen, I had to get honest with God like you could not imagine. I had to tell God what I loved more than him. And that was painful, believe it or not. Which was my pride. And I know what it is to... to, 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 to to have rage and hate in my heart, to want to do something and, and have the ability to do it and not care about the consequences, but say, I was either going to choose that or I was going to choose God. And I knew that the devil was trying to destroy my life. And I said, I'm going to choose God. And I did. And listen, God took me down through there. That's what the Bible says. Humble yourselves before God. Without the humility, there is nothing. If you can and I can humble ourselves before God, there is nothing. And what does humble yourself before God mean? Listen, it means the, the first thing God wants is your pride. <laughs> That's the first thing he wants is your pride. And that pride is nothing more but things that are priority in your life that mean more to you in life even than death. Some people rather die than give up their pride. Yeah, that's what it is. Some people it's their country, some people it's their, their community, some people it's a child, some people it's whatever it may be, you know what it is. And God says, humble yourself. Stand with me, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to share three verses with you this morning. As we close this up, and then we're going to have the honor and privilege to celebrate with two brothers here today that are, uh, that are going to be uh, ordained as deacons, okay? So it's a, it's a beautiful day, amen? And, uh, and uh, both of them, it, it's, it's beautiful to me because both that are being ordained uh, today as, as, as deacons were people that, that were under my father, right? And they had my father's blessing. And specifically, Jason Matheson. My father always believed in the call of God upon his life. You know, I mean, my father always believed that there was something in him that God wanted to use. So it's a blessing to be able to, to fulfill my father's dream. To not just ordain uh, uh, Jason Matheson as a, as a deacon here, but then Paul, who was under my father for many, many, many years. Amen? For, 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 for a season, he left and then he came back, but it was my father's preaching while he was in the hospital sick. He hit Google and listened to a sermon of my father, and the Lord led him back here. <laughs> wow. Even in death, God will honor you. Isn't that something? We're still talking about Abraham that died thousands of years ago, right? But that's what God told him, I will make you famous. Not in the way that men are famous here on earth or look for fame here on earth, but spiritually. People will teach about your faithfulness and, 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 and the way you honor me. He said, people will teach about that. For ages to come. That's beautiful. So we read the word of God in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Remember, we're dealing with the sacrifice of total surrender, but we're also dealing with striving for excellence in the kingdom of God. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus that if we died, but that if one died for all, then all died. Don't forget that. Then all died. That means you're dead. That those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. I'm going to read it one more time. For the love of Christ compels us. It urges us. Because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that, the result of his death, 
was that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Father, we're grateful for your word. You're a mighty God, a wonderful God, a powerful God. There's nothing impossible for you. You're Jehovah Sabaoth. You're the Lord of heavenly hosts. So your word is going to go out today. And, 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 oh, Lord, and whoever finds himself in a battle, in a conflict, my God, today you shall place a banner, a banner of victory in the midst of this situation in the name of Jesus. Lord, your word will go out today because you're Jehovah Rapha. You're the Lord, our healer. And those that are sick shall be healed. We believe your word. You're the Lord, our shepherd. You're the one who protects us. You're the one who guides us. You're the one who leads us today. And when your word goes out, oh Lord, that will be a reality in the life of those, almighty God, that are struggling for guidance. We thank you for all these things, my God, and we believe in our hearts that whatever we ask, with, ask Jesus or ask in the name of Jesus without wavering in our minds has to be done. It is done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So as I shared with you before, that the Apostle Paul, most people look at these verses as the ministry of reconciliation that we've all been called to. But in all reality, uh, biblically, they are people who are called to leadership. Right? And the Bible is clear about that, that when you're called to leadership, that before the foundation of the world, before God formed you in your mother's womb, it was there that he ordained you. He commissioned you. He assigned you to do something here on earth. Something that no one else can do but you. Whether it's a prophet to the nations, whether it's a teacher to the nations, whatever it may be, that's the truth. But there's something that we're all called to do. And this is called a, 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 a commissioned minister or a minister that is commissioned. You're commissioned. To go out and preach the gospel to all the world. You don't need to be a leader. You don't need to have this platform, right? You don't need to. You don't need to, to be behind a pulpit. You don't. You know. You can. You can go out and, and 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 visit the homeless in the streets, whatever it may be. It could be in Target. It could be in Walmart. Wherever you're at, your responsibility and my responsibility, our duty is to present Jesus, Hallelujah, as Lord and Savior, to lead men to Christ, the ministry of reconciliation. To reconcile men back to God. Because after, after, because after the fall, all men were separated from God. So most of these verses that I've been sharing with you in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, 15, 16, 17, deal with what theologians call the ministry of reconciliation. But Paul's going a lot deeper than that. If you read those verses, you know that there's, Paul's talking about that Christ died for all so that we be dead. Well, he's not talking about dead uh, spiritually, like dead in our trespasses and sin. No way he's not talking about, he's not talking dead physically because we're still alive. What kind of death is he talking about? The death to self. See, the sinner must die to sin. And before we come to Christ, we die to sin. But then the second step, the step that the world can't do, but God has called us to do, is to die to ourselves. Your dreams, your ambitions, your desires, the hunger and thirst that you have for what you like. God says you must die to that. And as I shared with you before, that, that the Apostle John, uh, of John the Baptist, has said one of the, the phrases that are most impactful in Scripture. He said it is necessary for me to decrease, to die, in order for him to increase. In other words, there's not enough place or room in this world for me and Jesus to exist. I must die. I mean, think about it. That's what he's saying. There ain't enough room for both of us. <laughs> he filled this assignment. Now, listen, go, because there's not enough room in your life for you and Christ to live. Can't. It won't work. You and I must decrease to allow Christ to increase in our life. If that doesn't happen, then, hallelujah, the scriptures in your life will never be fulfilled that he has chosen, you have not chosen him, but he has chosen you, and he has chosen you to bear fruit, much fruit. That will never happen. In 
in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 26. He says, my son, give me your heart. He didn't say, give me your finances. He didn't say, give me your house. He didn't say, give me your son. He didn't say, give me your daughter. But pastor, you just, you just, you just taught me that, that, that he asked for Abraham's son. And now you're saying that he's not asking for that? It seems like it's a contradiction. No, that's not going to happen unless he has your heart. See, he had Abraham's heart. And Abraham wanted to prove to God, you got my heart. You want my son? You want what I love? You want what's most important to me? Well, I'm going to show you, God. That's why the Bible says, try me now in this, because you can try God. Huh? Try him. Try me now in this. And see if I don't. I told you that before, that there's things that will open up heaven unto men. You may not think that. You may not believe that. Right? But it's a reality. It's the truth. And sometimes the problem first lies in that we don't believe the word of God to be the sole authority. See, we don't play scripture over science. If, if science still means more to you than the word of God, you're in trouble. If the, if the book about 48 laws of power means more to you than the word of God, you're in trouble. That's where it begins. Where, where it begins is you must know that the Bible, hallelujah, you must know that the word of God, you must know that scriptures is above all things and is the final authority. Doesn't mean we deny evidence, no. I went to the doctor, the doctor told me, you know, uh, uh, this is the way I think. You know, because I know people sometimes go to the doctor, and the doctor tells you you got cancer. Oh, I rebuke you, Satan. I ain't got no cancer. You got cancer. Yeah, God doesn't tell you to deny the evidence. Where in Scripture did God ever teach you to deny the evidence? No, but we believe and trust in a higher reality, and that's the Word of God. I could have cancer. I could have AIDS. I could have whatever the name of this, diabetes, or, or whatever it's called. I could have it, but I know one thing, that Jesus was smitten, and he was beaten, and, 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 and he was bruised, and he was broken, and by his stripes, I am healed. You don't deny the evidence. You just accept the higher reality of God's word. He said, give me your heart. If we don't give God our heart, that's why people still hold on to finances and claim finances to be theirs. Huh? That's why. That's why people with their time don't want to devote their time, right, to the things of God or to the church. Huh? That's why it's hard to get people to devote their time to the house of God, uh, to the ministry, to whatever it is that concerns God. Why? Because God yet to have your heart. When you give your heart to God, that means you give everything to God. That means you surrender to God. And that means when God calls you to do something, you do it. Why? Because it's not... not it is not I who no longer lives, but Christ that lives in me. It's a difficult thing, don't get me wrong. When you surrender to God, you give up control and you yield everything to him. That sounds scary. I mean, really think about it. Come on, I'm going to be real with you. I've been there before. When God's telling me I want everything, I but no, Lord, you can't take this. You can't have that. No way, my God. This this one thing is precious to me. This is like a pearl to me. It's like the diamante to me. I can't give it up. And God said, you must yield it to me. You must give me complete control of your life. It must be you who no longer lives, but I who live in you. You need to decrease so I can increase in you. And God won't stop at nothing. Huh? He's relentless. God will climb mountains. He'll kick down doors. But God will never stop loving you, chasing you, until his will is manifested in your life. And I'm being real with this. People sitting here today, well, they, they're struggling, they have a conflict, they're not at peace, you know, and they want to be, they desire it, they're sincere, they love God, you know, they want to pray, they want to fast, but they're not able to do any of these things. And I want to tell you why. Why? Because you have reservations. You have not given, you want all of God, but you don't want to give God all. All of you. Huh? You want to have your cake and eat it too. That doesn't work like that with God. God said you must give me control and you must yield to me. 
And when you do that, he says, give me your heart. Now listen good. And let your eyes delight in my ways. What are the ways of God? Think about that. What are the ways of God? We know the works of God. Healing, resurrect the dead, give sight to the blind. Right? We know the works of God. You see, God says something about, uh, 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 about Moses that I think we need to pay attention to. It wasn't Miriam. It wasn't Abraham. It, it, it wasn't Pastor Willie. No, it was God that said something about Moses. He said, the people know my works when Moses knows my works. That's more intimacy with God. Huh? So, so God is saying, listen to what he said. He said, let your eyes delight in my ways. So God doesn't want you to delight in his works. He wants you to delight in his ways. And that means to know God. Listen to what happens when you get to know the ways of God. Then you know what is of God and what's not. You understand that. Nobody's got to explain it to you. You understand that, that the news that you got from the doctor, that's not the ways of God. Huh? When you understand that, that your relationship is, is, is in a fluster, that, that, that it's at the point of divorce, you understand that that's not the ways of God. That is not the ways of God. So, so now you begin to understand what the ways of God is. God wants me to be healed. God wants me to be whole. God wants me to be complete. And that gives you peace. As you know what the next step is. Okay, Lord. Like I've always taught you about the situation with Joseph. You have many believers that, especially newcomers, and let's understand, for people who are just born again. You can't expect them overnight to be holy. You can't expect them overnight to be John the Baptist, to be Paul the Apostle. You can't expect that overnight. Sanctification is a process. But then you have people that have been in the Lord 20 years, 15 years, 30 years, whatever it is, and have educated, that have spent time in the Word acting like babies. You've got to ask yourself that. You know, that, that's not, it, the fault doesn't lie in God, it lies with me. So, that, and that's why I use Joseph's situation, because Joseph also questioned God. He did, he questioned God. But he didn't question God in a, in a, in a sense of, why is this happening to me? All oh, poor little me, and wallowing in pity. No, he was questioning God, what is your purpose in all of this? Huh? See, that's, that, that's the language and that's the response of a person who's totally surrendered to God. They understand the ways of God. God doesn't want me failing. God doesn't want me falling. God doesn't want me on my face. God doesn't want, no, God doesn't want any of those things. God wants me standing strong and powerful. Why? Because he is both able and powerful to keep you from falling. You got to know the ways of God. So then you got to begin asking yourself, what is the problem? The problem must lie in me. And here we go. Surrender. We surrender. That's the only way for us to be successful in all areas of our lives is a complete surrender to God. Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 10:23. Lord, I know that people's lives are not their own. It is not for them to direct their steps. That's surrender. That's of a person. That's the language. That's the lingo of a man who has surrendered. Did you know that your ways are not your own? That your life is not your own? So in surrender, you must understand that, that your life is not your own. That your life belongs to Christ. It belongs to God. You want to stop struggling? You want to have peace? You want to have clarity? You want to have all of God? Well, God is saying, I need all of you. Lord, I know that people's lives are not their own. It is not for them to direct their steps. If you're being honest with yourself this morning, you may agree and accept the reality that you stepped out there on your own. Huh? I had this conversation with somebody this week, a loving conversation about people, places, and things. Huh? See, when we go through difficulties, I, I know what it is to fall. Huh? 
on my face. I know what it is. But I also know the reason why I experienced what I experienced. And why I went through what I went through. The fault wasn't in God, it was in me. Not wanting to surrender all areas of my life to God. Say, I want to hold on to this. I enjoy this. I like this. I was stepping out there on my own. And that's what he means, that their steps are not all. The Bible says that a good man's steps have been ordered by who? By God. And what happens is that, that we go out, we like to go out on our own. We like to experiment. We, we, we like to, no, you got to be careful with people, places, and things. Who it is you're hanging out with, who it is, who it is that uh, the, the, the things that you're doing and the places that you're going to, you got to be careful because those are triggers and those will lead you back. know what it is. I've experienced it. And the problem never is in the fall. Did you know that? Never in the fall. The problem is, what are you doing before the fall? Go back, rewind, and check your steps. Look at all of it before you fell. And this is what I tell people. This is where the problem lies. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he's gone. The Bible says he goes and, and, and dry places, Romans seeking where he can rest, looking where he can live. And those are places that God doesn't frequent. Be careful where you go. Be careful who you speak to. Two people cannot walk together unless they agree. If you're walking with them, it's because you agree with them. Tell me what you eat, and I'll tell you who you are. Tell me who you hang out with, and I'll tell you who you are. You cannot become unequally yoked. Because when that unclean spirit comes back, those are the things. He's going to look for what are you violating in the word of God. That's what he's looking for. Remember, he's looking to trace something that belongs to him and you. Huh? I don't care if it's lust. I don't care what it is. That's an area of your life that you have yet to surrender to God. God says your life is not your own. And the only way for you to delight in his ways is to give him your heart. We all want to delight in the ways of God. Who doesn't want to delight in the ways of God here? We all do. But God is saying, in order for you to do that, you have to give me your heart. People think they give their heart to God. They, they really believe that. And, and, and I believe a lot of people are sincere, that they really believe that they're giving their heart to God. But there's evidence of that. There's evidence when you've given your heart to God, when you love God with all your mind, with all your strength. When you do, there's evidence behind that. And the greatest evidence of them all is the peace of God. doesn't matter how great the giant is. Everybody was afraid. The whole army of Israel was afraid to go out there. And this little 16-year-old boy, without no armor, with a slingshot, went out there. And, and, and he didn't just go out there to face the giant, you know, and, and, and throw the rock. He talked trash to the giant. He told, today I'm going to have your head. The giant laughing at this guy. le pasa el nene What's wrong with this child? And these, these men over here, these men, these grown men over here, these, these warriors, these soldiers, they send out but a child. It was that child that took his head. Boldness, confidence, that's what God gives you. Not fear. The word of God says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust the Lord with all your heart. Not part of it, not some of it. So when you surrender, and I've surrendered my life to God, there's a complete trust in God no matter what's going on. Nothing brings fear. Nothing upsets me. Nothing discomforts me. Why? Because I'm trusting in God with all my heart. And they can be giving you bad news, but listen, this is what the situation looks like. This is what the doctors are saying. This is what our finances look like. I don't see no future. I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. But I'll tell you something. If you trust in God with all your heart, if you surrender your life to God, there's no mountain that the enemy puts before you that God can't come. He says, and lean not on your own understanding. Listen, because that's what's happening. You're leaning on your own understanding. There's a way that you, you, you know to do things or you've been taught to do them, and 
God says, no, no, no. My ways and my thoughts are much higher than yours. Lean not on your own, but lean on God. Amen? He says, in all your ways, submit to him. That's the hardest part right there. Submit to him. That's the most difficult thing. Even for athletes in competition, the most difficult thing is to submit, is to surrender to a defeat. Right? What warrior, what, what competitor is willing to say, I surrender, is willing to wave the white flag? No. And that's what happens sometimes. I'm going to tell a little secret with you. And in the spirit, you'll be understand that the spirit of God is talking to you. That's what's going on in your life now. You keep coming around the same mountain. You keep facing the same problem, the same difficulty, and you're wanting to do it on your own. Lean not on your own understanding, but trust in God with all your heart. I was there. I know what it is. I want to do this. I can do it. I can get it done. Huh? And God said, well, you can get it done. Let's see if you can do it. Huh. I spent more than 20 years in prison. Behind trying to do it on my own. Submit to him. Wave the white flag to God. Like I said, the hardest part, the, the most uncomfortable part, the most uneasy part is to surrender to anybody, even to God. It makes you uncomfortable. I'm not going to have control. I'm not going to be one managing it. As if God was going to mess up your life. Huh? As he, no, submit to God, surrender all of it to God, and God will manage your life. Wave the white flag to God. Come out like they do in the old westerns, right, with their hands up, no weapon in their hands. Get on the knees and say, Lord, I surrender. That's what he's hoping for. That's what he's waiting for. And I'm telling you things are, like I said, there's some people here that you talk to them, and, 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 and not just here, but people that are listening, right, and, and, and they'll tell you their good experiences with God. Right? And they'll tell you that. But God wants to give you more. Huh? God wants to do more with your life. He wants to show you more. In the eyes of God, there is no, no, no generous. Huh? There's all, we're all servants of God. On the earth, we call men generous, and there's nothing wrong with that. We honor those that are worthy of honor. There's nothing wrong with that. But in the eyes of God, what he gives me, he'll give you. When John said in 1 John, in the 1 John, I can't remember what verse it is, he said that the same anointing, chapter 2, the same anointing that was in Christ, he says, is in you. And you need that no man teach you. Now, we know that God is teacher, so he's not contradicting. What he's saying is people come along a certain point in their life where they don't understand something, they don't comprehend something or situation or circumstance. And what he's saying is that Christ that walked here on earth and did all the miracles, signs, and wonders that he did and even raised the dead lives and abides in you, and he'll show you the way. You don't need to pick up the phone and call the pastor. You don't need to pick up the phone and call the teacher or the prophet. All you got to do is call out to God, and he says, and I'll show you dark things that you do not understand. Stand with me. Learning to surrender to God is probably the hardest thing you've had to ever go through in your life. The most difficult thing. It is the most vital and the most important on your journey. There's a lot of people that are going to get up to heaven. I mean, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, when it talks about at the judgment seat of Christ, will give you that picture. Some people will be conforming, and complacent with getting in stumbling. All I want to do is get in. Be careful with that thought. Huh? Because remember, when he came back, he gave one five talents, one two talents, and one one talent. The five and the two, they, they increased it. They, they exercised their talent, their abilities, and their gift, and they had more for their Lord when he came. One guy took it and buried it, right? Did he not? He buried it and said, because my Lord is harsh. He ain't easy. He's going to come back, and he's going to want extra. So at least I can give him his one. And his master said, you unfaithful servant. He said, you should have at least took it and put it in the bank and it would have received some interest. I mean, I'm not saying this, but the Lord is saying this. 
Men can tell you whatever and explain to you whatever theologically, and maybe it makes sense, maybe you'll receive it, I don't know. But I know that Jesus said the way to heaven is narrow, and only a few travel on it. He said, but the way to hell is big, it's wide, and many travel on it. I don't know what that means to you. But what it means to me is there'll be more people in hell than in heaven. So listen to what I'm going to tell you this morning or ask of you. If there's an area of your heart that you have yet or your life you have yet to surrender to 